Many secret societies have existed throughout human history, but none possibly more dark than this. Debauchery, sacrifice, black mass, ritualistic sex orgies, and alcoholism. These were some of the central and common practices of the occult organization in today's episode. These men and women that met in secret to worship Satan, Bacchus, and Venus, all in an attempt to summon the devil from the pits of hell and grace this club's members with his presence. And on more than one occasion, they succeeded. Welcome back for a new chapter of the Insidious Agenda podcast. I'm your host, Nick, and this is Chapter 34, The Story of the Hellfire Club. To first get an understanding of the Hellfire Club, we have to go back to its founding in the year 1718, where it was founded by Philip, the Duke of Wharton, in London. This iteration was the first to bear the name the Hellfire Club. Wharton was a nobleman who lived two separate lives. In the first, he was described as being a man of letters an old English term used to describe a man who devoted himself to study, or it could also be used for a highly regarded author. The second was a contradiction to the first, for Philip also bore the reputation of being a drunkard, a rioter, an infidel, and a rake. This second old English term, rake, was given to those who lived an immoral life, and often a man was for squandering away his fortune on alcohol, gambling, and women. When Wharton established the first Hellfire Club, it was a chance to indulge in those things not commonly accepted in society. Not many records were ever kept or released about this iteration, but the only members known to have frequented the club were Wharton's friend, Trevor Hill, the Earl of Hillsborough, his cousin, the Earl of Lichfield, and another friend, Sir Edward O'Brien. No other names of attendees or members have ever been released or discovered. The Hellfire Club was a direct, satirical contradiction to London's already popular Gentlemen's Club, which was a private club for those men who wished to discuss the arts, philosophy, and politics. The Hellfire Club prided itself on shock and awe, well, things that could be considered that at this point in history. The only thing the public really knew about it was that its members used the club to mock and ridicule religion. They believed the president of the club was none other than the devil himself. To play into this, the club's members began to refer to each other as devils. Interestingly enough for this time, the club accepted female members and treated them as equals. Thus, it was in direct contradiction to the male-only archetype of other clubs at this time. The Devils would meet every Sunday at different locations around London, often frequenting the Greyhound Tavern. The Hellfire Club wasn't out in public too often, however, as women weren't supposed to be seen in taverns. Thus, they would meet at other members' houses, or Wharton's Riding Club. As mentioned before, this club was meant to mock religion, like most, specific to Catholicism. They would consume dishes named Holy Ghost Pie, the Breast of Venus, Devil's Loin, and chase it down with their infamous Hellfire Punch. But the meeting was meant to be a bit of a spectacle as well, and its members would show up for the club meetings dressed elegantly as characters from the Bible. But as with everything, all things must come to an end, and the Hellfire Club closed its doors in 1721, taking place 
only after the King of England, George I, got involved with its closure. With his hand seemingly tipped by politicians and other nobility, including Robert Walpole, who was a direct political rival of Wharton, the king put forward a bill to shut down the horrible impieties and immorality of London, aimed specifically at the Hellfire Club. In the end, Wharton, with his relationship tarnished, was removed from Parliament altogether. Not having had enough of secret societies, Wharton joined the Freemasons the following year, in 1722, eventually becoming the Grand Master Mason of England. And this is where we depart from Philip, the Duke of Wharton, in our story, the original founder of the first Hellfire Club. I should mention that the Hellfire Club is more of an idea rather than the initial which actually did bear the namesake. Many private clubs of debauchery and depravity are considered Hellfire Clubs but may not have actually taken the name. Only years after the disbanding of Wharton's Hellfire Club, others like it began to spring up. The most popular was the club which met at the George and Vulture Inn through the 1730s. For touristy folks passing through London, the George and Vulture still exists today as a restaurant, should you wish to meet there for a quick bite like the next group did. Founded by Sir Francis Dashwood and John Montague, the Earl of Sandwich, in the 1730s, this pair would later go on to found the Order of the Knights of St. Francis in 1746, meeting at the same place they had in the 30s. Though initially held to only 12 members, the club grew in popularity, eventually forcing the president's hand to expand. The club was founded on free will, even using the motto, Fais à qui tu voudras, or in English, Do what thou will. Over a century later, it was this club's concept of personal freedom that would inspire parts of Aleister Crowley's religion of Thelema, as we talked about in Chapter 6. Over the years, many important members of society would frequent the Order's meetings. Robert Vontasar, Thomas Potter, Paul Whitehead, Benjamin Bates II, William Hogarth, and even in the later 1750s, Benjamin Franklin. They went through many name changes, including the Brotherhood of St. Francis of Wye, the Order of the Knights of West Wycombe, the Order of the Friars of St. Francis of Wycombe. And finally, in 1752, when they moved their meetings to Medmenham Abbey, they became the monks, or friars, of Medmenham. The first official meeting there was held on the 30th of April in 1752, coincidentally, Walpurgis Night, and was held at Sir Francis Dashwood's home, an occasion that could only be described as a failure. The presidents were forced to lease Midmenham Abbey on the Thames River as their new meeting place. They went on to do incredible work here, rebuilding the abbey in 18th century Gothic revival style under the artistic work of Nicholas Rivette. Their motto adorned the front entryway's door in stained glass. Although this was the headquarters, eventually they moved underground to a series of tunnels and caves that they had built under the West Wycombe Hill. It was here the club embraced the origins of the Hellfire Club, complete with mythological themes, phallic symbols, and an overall expression of sexual nature. In mockery of Catholicism, they practiced pagan rituals, often making sacrifices to Greek deities Bacchus and Venus. They adorned their halls with images of nymphs, and skulls of sacrificed hogs. In the early 1760s, the club entered a long and drawn-out decline due to Dashwood's promotions into offices within the House of Lords. He became vastly unpopular due to new taxes and the attempted arrest of political opponents. Various works were also written by Irish author Charles Johnstone that made pointed comments at high-ranking members of the club. As many members had begun to move further away, or had simply died, the club could no longer continue, 
and shut its doors in 1766. When Paul Whitehead, the secretary of the club, passed in 1774, all existing records of the club were destroyed. Where the club once held its meetings is now a tourist site known as the Hellfire Caves. Over the next two centuries, various other Hellfire clubs arose and met. None, possibly more popular than the Beggar's Benison in Scotland, which, from its founding in 1730, would meet for well over a century in both Glasgow and Edinburgh. There was also the Phoenix Society, established in honor of St. Francis to pay homage to Francis Dashwood. They used the motto, Una volso non deficit alter, or, when one is torn away, another succeeds. Finally, we come to the main subject of today's episode, the Hellfire Club atop Montpellier Hill, outside of Dublin. This iteration was founded in 1737 by the first Earl of Ross, John Parsons, and the Master of the Arts, James Warsdale. Parsons is an interesting character. Having previously been the Grand Master of the Irish Freemasons for six years, he came into some money. He received a rather sizable inheritance with the passing of his grandmother and set off in a large tour of Europe. This sojourn would eventually land him in Egypt, where he received the reputation of being a sorcerer for his dabbling in black magic. There, he is said to have come across scrolls that were taken from the library at Alexandria prior to its destruction. When he returned to Ireland, he founded a secret society known as the Sacred Sect of Dionysus, which, much like the Hellfire Club, was centered on the practice of celebrating Bacchus and Venus, wine, and sex. After this club disbanded, he became a founding member of the Hellfire Club. Parsons would serve as the first president. Worsdale did a depiction of the club's first members, of which there were five. Though the club records are scant and incredibly hard to come by, Wordsdale painted a picture of the most prominent members, specifically Henry Barry of Santry, Colonel Clements, Colonel Posenboy, Colonel St. George, and Simon Luttrell. Initially, the club's members met at the Eagle Tavern on Cork Hill in the center of Dublin. Their drink of choice was Scalfine. This was a mixture of whiskey and hot butter. Their mascot was a black cat, and club policy stated that a seat must be left vacant at each meeting in the event the devil should join them. Looking to become more secretive and operate outside the prying eyes of the city, the club rented the building known as the Connolly Hunting Lodge on Mount Pellier. They struck up a lease with the Connolly family. Interesting to note here is that it was the lodge's founder, William Connolly, who originally purchased Mount Pellier Hill from none other than Philip, the Duke of Wharton, the original founder of the Hellfire Club. It had a kitchen, servants' quarters, and many other small rooms. Up the stairs, you could find another two rooms and a large hall. Every window in the building points north, to offer a spectacular view of the city of Dublin. It was when the club relocated to this venue that they really bought into the do-as-you-will motto. When the club met, the president, known as the King of Hell, took his seat at the head of a table dressed like Satan, adorned with wings, hooves, and horns. The other members seated referred to themselves as books, and sat next to him. They left one chair unoccupied, again, meant for the devil if he chose to join them, and the first toast was always in his honor. In their mugs, the drink of choice continued to be scalfine, a drink so potent that many members are believed to have drank themselves to death in a single meeting. Lewdness, debauchery, Black magic and even demonic manifestations are believed to be the things that took place most often within the walls. 
With the club having been so secretive, the only accounts of what went on inside the building are stories, mostly local folklore, but still interesting. The first story comes from the building's construction in 1725. William Connolly had ordered his workers to make use of stones, already present on the hill, that were cairns for local graves. When the stones were destroyed and used in construction of the building's fireplace, the desecration was noticed by something. As the story goes, Satan took note of what Connolly's men were doing, and one evening in a storm tore the roof from the lodge in a fit of rage. It was from this that the location had its first brush with the supernatural. Because of this, Connolly had the roof reinforced with stone, which gave it a darker and more evil appearance. The locals even began to refer to it as a place of evil, a reputation which kept well into the stay of the Hellfire Club. It became known, like the original, as a place of debauchery, where its members, the wealthy and nobility, even politicians alike, frequented to take part in drink and acts of immorality. One of the founding members, Simon Luttrell, who was also the sheriff of Dublin, made a deal with the devil inside the club. He sold his soul, with the caveat that he get to keep it for seven more years, or seven years hence, as it was written in the contract. In exchange, the devil settled all of his debts. Years later, when the devil showed up to collect what he was due, he entered the club. He began threatening all who were present, and stated that the last man in the room would have his soul taken. Everyone rushed out, in a hurry tripping over one another. The only one left was Luttrell. Somehow, and it's unknown how exactly he did it, but Luttrell tricked the devil and was able to get out of the club, with the devil never claiming his soul. As it turned out, it wasn't always the acts of the club as a whole that gave the location its reputation, but it was the individual acts of its members. None possibly more notorious than Henry, the fourth baron of Santry. Much like Philip of Wharton, there were two sides to Henry. The first was a civil man of nobility. Though not perfect, he was much of what you would expect from a man of this time. However, when he was intoxicated, the Mr. Hyde side of him would come through. One evening... A member in service to his family was ill and had nowhere to go. Henry asked the man to have a drink with him, forcing him to drink down an entire bottle of brandy. As Henry laid the man down to sleep, passed out from drink, he began to soak the man's bed in whatever alcohol he had left. He set the bed alight and burned the servant alive. Of course, with his wealth and status he would get off easier than most. Many members of the club were believed to have taken an issue with his behavior and wanted nothing more than to be rid of him. Though he was tried and convicted, he never saw jail time or anything in the way of retribution. Instead, he was given exile and was forced to spend the remainder of his life alone in England. The locals... Though terrified of the club's reputation, did grow curious of the place, however. The son of a local farmer grew so curious that one evening, after hearing the sound of screaming cats from inside, he walked up to the property of the Hellfire Club and took a look around. He was noticed by various members who welcomed him inside so that he could see what the stories were about. The story has two outcomes. The first is that it's unknown what happened to him that evening, but the next morning, locals found him wandering the hillside in a daze. For the rest of his life, he was mute, deaf, and dumb. Even unable to remember his own name, it's believed that when he was drug inside, he witnessed a large black cat 
with fire in its eyes, seated at the head of the table. The club members may have been attempting the ritual of the Tegetum non cat, which I told you about already, in the Folklore Appendices episode about cat stories. So, as we already know from that episode, they were either trying to summon the cat she, or the demonic big ears, the devil, in cat form. Those who took part were given the gift of second sight and many wishes. The second part is that he was released, but passed away some time during the night. He was found dead the next morning by other locals. When they brought this revelation to their priest, the host decided that they would march up to the Hellfire Club to investigate. They were met with a seemingly interesting, yet horrific sight. There was an entire banquet laid on, with the club's mascot prowling around the room. It was a black cat, the size of a fully grown Dalmatian, with horns and evil eyes rounding out its look. The priest was terrified, but remembered he had brought a holy water. He would attempt to banish the hell cat by way of the rite of exorcism. He was able to destroy the animal, which attacked the accompanying members of the town before it disappeared into the night. In another version, the priest grabbed hold of the cat, and when conferring the rite, watched as a demon was driven from the animal's body. At some point in the 1750s, the club caught fire. Some believe that it was set alight because the Connolly family refused to renew the lease with the Hellfire Club. Another, and the most believed story, in line with the club's activities, states that after a meeting one evening, the books became so incredibly drunk that the club exploded into one big orgy. Everything seemed like it was going fine, until one of the servants spilled alcohol on prominent member Thomas Byrne Chapel Whaley. Whaley earned his nickname because of the hatred for the Catholic Church especially its priests, and for quite literally burning a church to the ground. Whaley doused the servant in brandy and set him on fire. The servant ran wild, clinging to the tapestries and linens and set the whole club ablaze. As many members were too drunk to escape, they burned to death inside because of it. Either way you have it, the club was forced to relocate to the steward's house in Killikey, just down the road, before disbanding in 1760. The steward's house still stands today, like the shell of the Hellfire Club's old hideout. It, too, has the reputation for being haunted and stalked by a large black cat. Thomas Whaley passed away in 1769 and left 60,000 pounds, about $8 million today, to his son, also named Thomas Whaley, but who had the nickname Buck. Buck Whaley also inherited lands and other things that paid him an annuity of 16,000 pounds. He was known for his love of gambling, and at one point going so far as to win 15,000 pounds from the Duke of Leicester, having completed a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and back within two years. Buck Whaley and some of the original members attempted to restore their old club building in 1771 under their new identity, the Holy Fathers. The stories about this group were no less dark or grim than they had before, even treading into the realm of cannibalism. The most prominent story about their group was that they abducted a local farmer's daughter, killed her, and then ate her. Buck Whaley didn't last too long in the new club, as on one occasion he came face to face with the devil. It scared him so bad he had to flee Ireland, first arriving in the Isle of Man, before subsequently settling in England. He passed away in the year 1800 because of an alcoholic fever. Their reborn iteration had lasted 30 years, and in the early 1800s, after Buck Whaley's death, the property was sold to the Irish government. In keeping with local tradition for the building, 
In 1849, during the visit of Queen Victoria to Ireland, the roof was set ablaze with barrels of tar, making it appear as its namesake, the literal Hellfire Club. Today, the Montpellier Hellfire Club is able to be visited, complete with walking trails, and you can visit the old burned-out building on top of the hill. But one more story exists that I haven't told you yet, and will bookend the story of the Montpellier Hellfire Club with the most frightening one. One dark and stormy evening, members of the club were meeting. Playing cards that night, their ambiance was broken by the sound of three distinct loud knocks on their heavy wooden door. The books opened the door and saw a strange, cloaked stranger. There was really nothing out of the ordinary about this man, save for the fact he had with him a lot of money. As they were playing cards, they quickly invited the man inside, and he joined them at the card table. Sometime during this game, everyone was enjoying themselves when one of the patrons mistakenly dropped one of his cards on the floor. As he bent down to pick it up, his eyes met something he didn't expect. The mysterious stranger, in place of feet, had cloven hooves. The club member sat up, his eyes met the stranger's, and he kept playing. He sat for much of the evening, terrified, even breaking out into a cold sweat and shivering. After some more time went by, he couldn't take it any longer. He shot up, pointing at the stranger and informing the others of what he had seen. The stranger stood up and pointed and laughed mockingly at the man in a horrible, sinister tone before he disappeared into a cloud of black smoke. Just as the stranger disappeared, the book who had exposed him dropped dead to the floor in front of the other terrified club members. And thus, the Hellfire Club had finally met with the one they so desperately sought, and he saw fit to drag one of them back to hell with him. With this message we bring to close the story of the dark, debaucherous, occult-focused secret society known as the Hellfire Club. I hope you enjoyed today's story, learning about one of the most iconic places and darkest parts of Dublin's history. Before you go, I would appreciate you leaving a review or a thumbs up, but of course, do as you will. If you want to leave a detailed review, the link to Podchaser can be found in the link tree within the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of the amazing episodes to come, like this Friday, when I release a special episode for St. Patrick's Day. In addition of the folklore appendices, where I tell the stories of Irish legends, the Banshee, the Morrigan, and the Abertach. New episodes of the Insidious Agenda podcast release every Tuesday at midnight Eastern Standard Time. But for now, it's time to close the cover of the Insidious Agenda. I'll see you again next week, and thank you for listening.